Welcome to the Cleveland Museum of Natural History's Specimen Spotlight. I'm your host, Lee Hall, and while the scenery around me may be jarring, Natural History Museum collections are extremely important for understanding changes in our biodiversity. Today we're here with Dr. Tim Matson, who is the curator of vertebrate zoology. Hey Tim, thanks for having us. Oh, nice to have you here, Lee. So you have mm. some very interesting items here. The first one mm. I want to point out is a sea lamprey. Correct. And where were these sea lampreys collected? Well, actually, no, these, this is a, an invasive species. It's not native to uh, the Great Lakes. However, they have become very well established and they, have, they are an invasive nuisance species. And these are out of the Grand River or Conneaut Creek. Those are two streams that are treated with lamprosites to try to control the numbers of the sea lamprey. They come up streams to breed after about one to seven years in larval stage feeding on uh, invertebrates. They move downstream and become transformers where the mouth parts transform from being filter feeders to becoming predators. By the time they get down to, in this case, Lake Erie, they are in adult stage. They live there for 18 to 20 months or so, grow in size up to about 22 inches or so, and that's where these came. They were killed in the process of coming upstream. So Tim, you mentioned that the lamprey is an invasive species to Lake Erie. Can you touch upon what exactly that means and how it has affected the uh, Great Lakes fisheries? Yeah, the um, sea lamprey was not a native to the upper Great Lakes, but with the construction of the Well and Canal around 1825, that opened the avenue then to the upper Great Lakes. And at some point, well, they came in. And the first uh, sea lamprey documentation uh, was in 1923. And uh, that was in the eastern basin of Lake Erie, and within just a matter of a few years, it had spread up to the upper Great Lakes, Lake Michigan, and Lake Superior. Mm. And the adult sea lamprey is a highly efficient predator. It's an external parasite that kills fish, attaches to the side of a fish, rasps a hole, and then sucks out the blood and tissue fluids until the fish is dead, and then it goes finds another fish. So we spend a lot of time, effort, and money trying to control the sea lamprey, its numbers, because the, the Great Lakes fisheries is not only very important economically, but there are a lot of sports fishermen, commercial fishermen that depend on it for their livelihood or for their recreational values. So as a biologist <clears throat> who studies amphibians, this is a concern because of what uh, the effects that the uh, mitigation procedures have on native Ohio wildlife. That's correct. Streams, which brings us to these guys here. What are these? Right. Now these are mud puppies. These are the second largest salamander in Ohio, superseded only by the hellbender. It's a totally aquatic species, and they live in our, some of our lakes, including Lake Erie. They live in many of our larger streams. And normally, well, I do study amphibians, but the reason I'm studying mud puppies is because of their relationship, not the evolutionary relationship as such, but control procedures for the sea lamprey have a very negative impact on the mud puppy. And that's where I can make it. I'm an ecologist, and I'm interested in the ecology and the population biology of what's going on between these two and see what the impact of these lamprosides have. And uh, so I see that these specimens all have had some dissection done. Yes, they have. And uh, I want to point out that in the lamprey here, um, there's a mass of tissue here. What is that? Right, now this is a female and these are eggs. Each female, uh, a large female, can produce up to about 100,000 eggs. And this is what you wow. see coming out. There are literally hundreds and maybe even thousands of eggs right there. They're very small. I use dissection uh, as a method for accurately determining, determining what the sex of the organism is. Also, when I have females, I want to see the condition, the size, and the number of ova, or eggs. And then we measure those, and we can correlate the development of the ova over the course of a year. And we've gotten a lot of very good information, uh, ecological and natural history information, by doing that. You've been doing this study for how many years now? This, this is the 30th year. Wow. A long time. You must love what you do. I do. I have a lot of data. And uh, now it's time to put it all together again. Uh, it's been very 
instrumental in forming some of the uh, uh, some of the natural history information that we've gotten now, and uh, we know more about its reproductive behavior. We know a little bit more about its movements. Hmm. Fantastic. Uh, well, Tim, thank you so much for letting Specimen Spotlight come in and hang out in vertebrate zoology today. Yeah, well, thanks for coming into our lab. Always nice to talk about what's going on here and some of the research that we're carrying out. Great. Right. We'll see you next time. Okay.